every block. Okay. So, successfully yeah. perform awake intubation, airway block can be done. Okay. So, that is the main reason for that. So, for, for that, you must first know the sensory innervation of the upper airway. That is the first requisite. Then, what are the agents that you will use for topicalization or blocking that uh, sensory nerves? Then, what are all the application techniques available for doing that topicalization and block the nerves? And what are all the regional anesthesia techniques like uh, direct blocking of the nerves? This is surface application. Topicalization means you just apply them on the surface of the mucous membrane. What is the speed you said? You have to wait for 5 to 15 minutes. What is the speed with which the mucous membrane will absorb the local anesthetic and get anesthetized? Is it, is it going to take 5 minutes? What is the classical example given for application of a local anesthetic to the mucous membrane and the speed with which it gets absorbed? Local anesthetic, when applied to the mucosal surface, it gets absorbed as fast as a blotting paper absorbed ink. In those days, we used to have the fountain pens, which are filled with ink you know, in the bottle. I, uh, we used to have Park, Parker, we used to have Iris, uh, Ultra, all those Hero, uh, Hero. brands of... Hero <laughs> pens. Uh, we used to have all those brands of blue ink, dark blue ink, black ink, all those inks were there and we used to fill it up in the pen and write it. They are called fountain pens. So, you, they used to use a blotting paper or a chalk to remove the excess uh, ink from the writing. So, it's a rapid, that much of rapid absorption will happen in the mucosal surface. That is why when you spray, you have to be very careful with the total concentration and volume that you use. You cannot simply use a very high concentration in large volumes. Then you will produce systemic toxicity, both which we are going to talk a little later. So these four steps are very, very uh, five safe sedation techniques. So these are the five first pri primary requisites for airway block. Sensory innervation anatomy, you must know. You must know what drug you are going to use and in what technique you are going to use and whether you are going to do a direct nerve block like regional anesthesia and whether it is going to be landmark uh, oriented or whether you are going to use ultrasound guided and does the patient require any sedation because he is going to be awake and you have to allay his anxiety. So these five things are the primary requisites for doing an airway block. Now coming to the knowledge of sensory innervation of the airway, uh, you mentioned that you can divide the airway into nasal and oral cavities together the pharynx and larynx. These are the three anatomical divisions you have to block. Now, the sensory innervation of the upper airway is supplied to so three areas, three nerves. Remember like that. The nasal and oral cavity together one area, the pharynx one area, the larynx one area, supplied by trigeminal, lossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. So, three areas, three nerves. And this picture tells you the three nerves which are supplying and the three areas. You can see this is the nasal and part of the oral cavity. This is the uh, pharyngeal pharynx and the uh, tongue, this is the larynx. So, three areas are there. So, nasal and oral mainly by trigeminal, uh, pharynx by glossopharyngeal, you can remember pharynx by pharyngeal and vagus to the larynx. So, these are the three nerves which are supplying and this is the nasal cavity uh, nerves. So, you have the posterior ethmoidal, you have the external nasal, you have the greater palatine, nasopalatine. So, these are all the nerves which are supplying the nose if you want to perform a nasal intubation. And you can classify them the lower part. Vagus nerve supply uh, gives to the superior laryngeal and recurrent laryngeal. Superior laryngeal is divided into external and internal branches. Recurrent laryngeal gives both sensory and motor. And glossopharyngeal mainly sensory going to the valicula and base of the tongue. So, 
you can see this is the sensory above the cords that is internal branch gives the sensation above the cord level whereas recurrent laryngeal gives the sensation below the cord level that is the uh, the uh, tricoid thyroid the tri above the tri uh, tracheal rings this is the main nerve which is going to give for the entire area so these are all the the greenish things are the sensory the yellowish uh, things are the motor so two motor branches are tricothyroid muscle and the posterior tracheal arytenoid so but when you block this these muscles are also likely to be blocked so you have to be quite careful with that and uh, the greater and lesser palatine nerves give the sensation to the nasal turbinates and posterior two thirds of the nasal septum the anterior ethmoid innervates the remainder of the nasal passage so three nerves greater lesser palatine and anterior ethmoid so everything is three with this anatomy so three nerves for the nose greater and lesser palatine anterior ethmoid then glossopharyngeal nerve provides sensation to the posterior third of the tongue valvula anterior surface of epiglottis and walls of the pharynx and tonsillar areas the superior laryngeal nerve innervates the base of the tongue posterior surface of the epiglottis the area epiglottic fold the arytenoid and lateral laryngeal provides sensation to the trachea and vocal folds so below the vocal cord is the recurrent laryngeal now what is topical anesthesia earlier they were using cocaine it was the only local anesthetic with a vasoconstrictor property so you need not use a separate vasoconstrictor if you are going to use cocaine therefore is particularly useful for topical anesthesia of the nasopharynx which is highly vascular so cocaine available availability is in 5% and 10% solution and in paste form also i have used this with a rhinoplasty surgeon in uh, in cases it used to produce an excellent bloodless feel uh, you just apply it and wait for 2 minutes and then start the procedure it will be absolutely play, uh, bloodless feel and the maximum recommended dose is 1.5 mg per kg so because we are applying it in the mucosal area we have to know the maximum dose safe dose otherwise we will land up with toxicity and it should be used with caution in patients with coronary artery disease because it produces severe vasoconstriction it can cause hypertension and it can cause pseudocholinesterase deficiency also mm. a mixture of 2 ml of 10% cocaine and 1 ml of 1 in 1000 adrenaline 2 ml of bicarbonate and 5 ml of sodium chloride solution which all make total of 10 ml is called the moffet solution this is commonly used in rhinological that is the ent nose procedures to provide local anesthesia vasoconstriction and decongestion it is also used to topicalize the nasal mucosa prior for optimal condition for nasal intubation so this was uh, a very common short note question in the olden days every 4 uh, years or 3 years you used to get a question on moffet solution and this combination is given only in the synopsis of lee old textbook no other book you will find it nowadays you can find it of course in the net also so the four things are there in the composition 2 ml of 10% cocaine 1 ml of 1% 1 in 1000 adrenaline 2 ml of sodium bicarbonate what is the role of sodium bicarbonate in this any idea what will happen to the ph of the solution when soda bicarb is added ph will increase ph will increase yeah it will become alkaline what is the idea of making it alkaline faster onset and lesser pain on injection okay, okay. two okay. advantages of adding bicarbonate to any local anesthetic if you are going to inject it it causes less injection pain and the onset of action is hastened because most local anesthetic agents are all acidic in nature so they will be more painful on injection and they will take a little longer time by alkalinizing them we can enhance or make it act faster and rapidly okay that is the answer that you have to give sometimes even in epidural we add sodium bicarbonate to hasten the onset of action Uh, if you when the surgeon is very itchy and he doesn't want to wait for the epidural to act and then is in urgent mode, 
then you can add one or two ml of sodium bicarbonate to the entire volume of propylene acetic you inject into the epidural and they you will clinically see the onset is much faster there the next drug that we use is lidocaine of course benzocaine i have not heard or used and uh, i don't know whether the textbooks also continue to give about this so lidocaine is the most commonly used local anesthetic for airway, airway topicalization why are we not using uh, bupivacaine or rocuvacaine why we always prefer lidocaine faster onset of action of lidocaine very good okay then what is the reason with the adrenaline preparation is readily available with lidocaine okay any other more important reason um safety margin is highest with lidocaine okay? that is why we are using it for anti as an anti arrhythmic agent directly into the intravenous group okay so the toxicity ratio is very very high with lidocaine so you don't normally produce uh, a toxic reaction and it is available in 4% and 10% spray systemic absorption from topical application of the upper way is lower than expected so in practice higher doses can be used the uh, recommended is uh, 4 and 7 kg so um, to 4 mg per kg without adrenaline 7 mg with uh, adrenaline and uh, before using this you can use dilomethazoline and phenylephrine also available with uh, lidocaine to produce local anesthesia and vasoconstriction so these are the two agents which are commonly used so you even if you don't mention about benzodiazepine okay, you will not be penalized in the exam sir actually okay. sir actually benzocaine is used only for topical anesthesia sir. it's never given any that else that's a, lo a lozenges i think i have seen yes only sir lozenges. only only lozenges am am and that that's what it is used for sir. Ah. benzocaine is only that sir there's not it's not it's not given injectable at all sir anywhere ah, so for yes. i've never read it anywhere sir. application technique spray from a container like your uh, 10% spray or local anesthetic soaked in ribbon gauze which are packed into the areas which you are you want to anesthetize that is direct application and cotton applicators similar to the ribbon gauze mckenzie technique and mucosal atomization device or inhalation of nebulized lidocaine and spray as you go via epidural catheter which is now commonly done when you do a bronchoscopy now you can use lidocaine jelly also the nasal area you can apply directly the jelly and leave it there it will immediately anesthetize that area or you can use the spray which most of you will be familiar with and this is the 4% lidocaine solution what are the preparations of 4% lidocaine you know there are two preparations in 4% one is the aqueous another is viscous so when you want to spray you can use 4% aqueous but if you want to just leave it like a gargle in the pharynx to block the nerves you can use the viscous which has a pink color so that to differentiate between the aqueous and the viscous preparations of 4% this case will be slightly pinkish in color whereas aqueous is just like your regular lidocaine water lidocaine they are colorless and uh, this also is a 22 gauge needle with 5 ml syringe for local uh, which can be inserted into the trachea for application normally they advocate that you insert a needle through the trichothyroid membrane aspirate and then strip but the safer technique will be this so that you don't uh, uh, have the problem of the needle breaking and getting lost to the trachea so uh, this is the packing set what things you require for if you want to do the local anesthetic so ribbon gas packing or cotton applicator you need a bowl or a gallon cup you need the local anesthetic you need something to clear then what is this can you all see this a u shaped instrument 
Tudicum nasal speculum. Very good. It's a nasal speculum, not a spay. It is a nasal speculum with which you can void and void open the nasal cavity. What is this called? There's an angulation. Crocodile forceps. Crocodile or the bayonet forceps. Okay. Bionet like the, the AK-47 gun. Okay, so the your hand will not block the tip of the uh, forceps. So this is okay. the uh, backing forceps that you can use. This is the ribbon gas. This is the jelly which you can apply initially. And then you pour the 4% here. And okay. soak this ribbon gas. And then how do you apply? You have to apply like this. So you can use the nasal forceps or sponge. And you have to pack it in the gap between the turbinate bones. So you call the conca. So packing is also has a technique. So you have to do like this and pack it, not just stuff it like a, a waste paper basket and leave it there. You have to do it methodically so that the entire nasal cavity will get blocked. And coming to the, this is what is the name of this? You have a syringe here, you have a three way tap, you have the local anesthetic loaded here, you have a green tube, you have a cannula. What is this called? I gave some names in the earlier slide. It's it. called the McKenzie's kit. Okay, so you use a flow of oxygen which is attached to a number syringe, <clears throat> and you have a three way tap. So you open the tap. Allow the gas to flow, and you inject it, it will automatically get stabilized and then it will be sprayed evenly into the area. So, this is what is called the McKenzie's kit. And this is the atomizer where you can use the tip to spray it much more, cover a larger area. And this, you all of you may be familiar with nebulization. So, you have the mask here, you have the chamber to contain the local anesthetic and oxygen or gas will be flowing through that and it will break and patient will get anesthetized. And this is the bronchoscopy using the epidural catheter. You pass it through the working uh, side port and then attach the syringe and the spray as you go technique. You can do like this. So these are the various methods of application of the local anesthetic. Now, what are all the regional anesthesia techniques you can do? Classify them into landmark technique and ultrasound based technique. So, the nerves that you can block are glossopharyngeal nerve block. This provides, uh, <coughs> blocks the sensation of the posterior third of the tongue, valicula, and provides a sensory limb for gag reflex. So, mainly the gag reflex is blocked, uh, mm. abolished when you do a glossopharyngeal nerve block. So this is useful for abolishing this reflex. And there are two approaches, as he said, intraoral and peristyloid, but we don't practice peristyloid because of the complication. And uh, most easily blocked by the palastoglossal arch approach. So what you have to do is if the mouth opening is good, you can open the mouth of the patient, retract the tongue. This is the tonsil, this is the palato. The glossal arch. Okay, this is the palate connecting to the tongue, so it is called the palatoglossal arch. And on the posterior most, behind the last molar, inferior molar, you just this is the needle. So if you can see this, this is the syringe here, a long needle is inserted. So you just go and puncture this palatoglossal arch and deposit about two to three ml. Within no time, the base of the tongue, this pharyngeal area, everything will get uh, blocked. You have to repeat it on the opposite side. You can't just do it on one side, you have to do it bilaterally, and then it will be very well anesthetized. Now, next comes the superior laryngeal nerve block. Mm -hmm. This is the external approach. So, this is the hyoid cartilage, this is the thyroid cartilage. So, the superior laryngeal nerve comes out through the uh, below the carnua of the hyoid cartilage. So, externally, you can palpate, stabilize that hyoid cartilage or push it to one side. And then, what I do is always go and hit the bone, hyoid cartilage, and then walk down the bone and then pierce the cricothyroid membrane, uh, cricohyoid membrane, 
just below the cricket cartilage and deposit about 1 to 1.5 ml you will definitely block this so repeat that on the other side you will block both the superior laryngeal nerve if this block is done very well because this supplies the sensation above the vocal cord this block if it is very well done your blind nasal intubation or awake intubation will be 100% successful you can be rest assured about it so this is a very important block all of you should learn very well <coughs> recurrent laryngeal block is done by transtracheal route so this is the thyroid cartilage this is the tricuspid cartilage this is the hyoid cartilage so you identify the tricuspid membrane and uh, they are using actually a needle but uh, in practice of most of us do this but ideal is to use a 22 gauge venflon <coughs> attached to a syringe and then puncture the tricuspid membrane aspirate once you get a free flow of air take out the needle leave the cannula there and then attach the syringe again to the cannula and then inject the solution so even if the patient coughs the cannula will not it will be flexible it will not break there is a metal needle there are chances that it can break so it is always safer to use a 22 gauge cannula remove the stylet like the needle and then attach the <coughs> local anesthetic two to one to two ml will be sufficient when the pay ask the patient to take a deep inspiration and then inject at the time so that the drug will travel down and block the entire area don't inject when the patient is breathing out so wait for the patient's respiration attempt tell him to take a deep breath and then inject one to two ml at the time patient will develop a good cough and it will spread to the entire area and uh, it will be nicely anesthetized then these are all landmark based techniques that you have to palpate the thyroid <coughs> you have to palpate the hyoid you have to identify the tricuspid so these are all called landmark techniques the same thing when you do with an ultrasound structures can be identified more easily what are all the structures you have to identify you have to identify hyoid thyroid parahyoid membrane superior laryngeal artery and laryngeal nerve all these structures can be identified so you hold the probe like this transversely parallel to the hyoid bone and then see the picture like this you get like this you go to the <coughs> thyroid this is the nerve that you are seeing and you are directly going in blocking it 100% Uh, guarantee. So that is how the uh, ultrasound guidance is done. Translaryngeal, you have to hold the probe in a longitudinal fashion, not in the horizontal fashion. And then again, you puncture the tricuspid membrane and you inject it. The structures you have to identify here are tracheal rings, tracheal cartilage, thyroid cartilage, tricuspid membrane. and if the probe is placed longitudinally in the midline the tracheal rings can be easily seen and then the probe is advanced cranially the tracheal cartilage can be seen next and this is slightly elongated structure it is larger and more superficial than the tracheal rings that is how you identify it. so you start uh, from the this is the clavicle this is the chin side so you place the probe with longitudinally like this first identify the ring and then slowly go towards the jaw and you will find the tricuspid cartilage in the uh, thyroid cartilage and the tricuspid thyroid membrane can be <coughs> identified and if you further advance the thyroid cartilage also can be seen and tricuspid thyroid membrane lies between the caudal border of the thyroid cartilage and capillary border of the tricuspid cartilage keep the probe in midline with the tricuspid thyroid membrane in the middle And then puncture, so it is very quite easy. Uh, the block can be performed under real-time sonography also, simply tilting the probe from the midline to a parasagittal position, keeping the tricuspid cartilage in view. So the needle entry point should be just cranial to the tricuspid cartilage. It can be seen in the ultrasound pictures. Now coming to the <coughs> sedation technique. aim of conscious sedation is not only allow the patient to tolerate the procedure but it should be very very optimal you should not sedate too much especially if the patient has a very difficult airway 
we must not over sedate the patient it may lead to loss of airway and the problem of uh, can't intubate can't ventilate scenario so ideal sedation condition involves comfortable patient responsive to commands you must keep communicating with the patient and make sure that he is alert and he is able to obey your commands and breathe spontaneously at the same time you must have some degree of amnesia so the two drugs which are best for that one which is not available for us for theory sake we have to write this this is available so dexmedetomidine seem to be an wonderful drug nowadays for this sort of purpose the safe sedation can be achieved slowly by administering sedative drugs and continually communicating with the patient and you can use a bis monitor also to aid the guide level of sedation so if you go to 40 and 50 that means he is deeply sedated so you maintain it between 70 and 60 that means that an ideal sedative restore okay so that is what you have to remember about two points that you can try to Any questions on that? So, if you classify your answer like this, uh, the first four five things that you mentioned, then the anatomy, the uh, drugs, the techniques, you know, uh, both the topical as well as nerve block, the answer I think will be more complete and uh, more well presented. What is your opinion, Dr. Ramu? Yes, sir. Do you have anything to add? Doctor Venkatesh Sir is not at all seen in the picture. Is he there, or his name only is reflecting? Yes, sir. 